um, good morning, everybody. Um, or for those who have already watched the previous talk, good noon. Um, welcome to our seminar. Uh, we are Barrow, and I'm uh, Urs, and uh, this is going to be about Superlighter, a game some of you may know from last year, and what has happened since last year, and um, how it improved in graphics, and what kind of over-the-top graphics stuff Vero has implemented to make it look very awesome and very modern. Um, now, I'll start with a disclaimer. We're probably going to take much more than an hour if we want to show all content. So, uh, sooner or later, uh, the guys at the back will cut off, uh, cut off off. This also means that at the end we won't have uh, uh, any time for questions, so if you have any questions just raise your hand in between and uh, feel free to ask anything at any time because it's, it's better to have it on the spot than at the end. But let's start. Okay, who are we? Um, you probably know Bero from Fabrosh. Um, he's uh, been in the scene for, for a very long time, much longer than me actually, and uh, he's probably the person who has written all code that's conceivable to mankind. I'm always impressed. Um, I am Urs of Mercury. Uh, I'm actually only acting as his voice today, and I'm presenting, uh, well, the subject. So what is the subject? Um, the, the game Superlighter, as some of you may know from last year's Game Compo, it was released for the first time. It is um, a mo modern, futuristic, flying, racing game in the style of Wipeout um, that has originally been just written as a basic 3D engine thing with a basic game thing and then evolved from it because more and more um, features came into it, more and more rendering technologies came into it, and now it's got this enormously large list of, of uh, well, complicated sounding expressions that uh, I, I personally, when, when Barry started asking me if I can help this uh, seminar, I, I said, I know maybe half of these words, but um, this is going to be part of the talk to explain to you all the words you don't know here and uh, show you what you can do to make a, to go from an old style, very basic rendering engine to something extremely modern. Yeah, so that's the topic, the rendering technologies, and how it came from being more or less a renderer, the style that was uh, uh, typical in the 90s, to something very modern. And compare that to Bero 64K, but also the Mercury 64K from yesterday, because the rendering technologies used are very similar. So yeah, this is this is how it started. Um, the, uh, the the game basically started by having a map renderer. This is like a racing map, and there is nothing much except a couple of polygons that are being displayed. And this, as you can see, does not look very fancy yet. Even if you add um, like a simplified uh, flying device that casts a shadow, you wouldn't really call this high-end modern graphics. And um, one step further, this was the version as it uh, was in the compo one year ago. You can see there is a map that has textures, but the lightning doesn't exactly look like something modern or realistic. And the, the sprites themselves, you know, it's textures, and they are a little bit buried in lightning and so on. But um, people actually said, if you go to the next slide, it looks like from the 90s. And it basically was. What it was using was more or less forward rendering. You have you draw your triangles on the screen, and you have a texture color for every point of the triangle, and then you decide to either just display that or make it a little bit lighter or a little bit darker, depending on light and shadow, and that is it. But as everybody knows who's ever looked at how light really works in real world, this is not how real life works. You don't have just a color, and then you make it brighter or darker, but you actually have physical processes of light interacting with matter. So um, the, the plan was to improve it and to go more into something that looks more realistic. And there's been this recent trend in, in graphics development to use physically-based rendering techniques. Um, so if we, if we look at how, how it was before, the, the old-style rendering technologies, you want to render a pixel. You, you have your triangles, you have the graphic card on, on doing all your stuff, and you want to calculate lighting. For example, you want to look at the specular reflection of light on a surface. Light comes from a light source, bounces off the surface, and then goes to the, to the viewer, and you have to decide how bright that is. And all, those of you who have implemented basic rendering techniques know that you, you have an incoming color that comes from your texture, and then you just take the, the dot product of your reflected vector with your, with your viewing vector, or equivalently formulated using the half angle of your normal and your half vector, um, and then you just use some exponent n to say how shiny your object is. If this n is a small number, your object looks more or less rough, and if you, this n is a large number, you get like a tight, focused, specular reflection spot. 
which more or less works, and which is what people have been using for a long time now to get reflected shininess, but this is not really physically motivated. That's just saying, yes, we want to have like, like some reflectiveness. Um, so instead, this was thrown away. Um, and the, the modern way to do this um, is uh, physically based rendering. Now, uh, most of the stuff that's presented here when it goes about physically based rendering is derived from the Unreal Engine 4 because the Unreal Engine 4 implements it and also has very extensive and very good documentation about what rendering techniques can be used and how, how they are physically motivated. So um, let's start with how can we replace um, our material properties. I mean, in an ultra renderer, you would give something like the material has this color. You just basically say in your texture how it looks. But this is not how it looks. It's not a physical quantity. Instead, we replace this, this color texture by a whole bunch of textures that uh, specify the physical characteristics of how light interacts with matter. So instead of just one uh, color, you have a couple of different colors that a material can have. You have something like the albedo color that is actually what light gets absorbed by the material and what goes back out. That is not like a diffuse light. That is not what you see. For example, a, a brick in a dark room will still be black to the eye, but it is still a red brick. So that is the albedo texture, uh, albedo, albedo color. But it can have an entirely different color when, when you know, glowing. You, if you look at, a, at an LED that switch off, it's yellowish, but if you switch it on, it might be blue. So there's a difference between albedo color and emissive color. And then specular color can be something else as well. Um, for most non-metallic uh, materials, or reflections you see are always white. If you, if you look at, I don't know, any, any shiny stuff around you, you see the reflected light sources in white. It, the only thing that's not white are metals. Copper, for example, reflects reddish, and gold reflects yellowish, and titan has a little bit of a bluish tint to it. Um, but that as well can be uh, mapped onto surfaces and give uh, things structure. And um, then you have normal maps, which just gives you large-scale surface roughness. And then the important thing that's new for, for this physically-based rendering is the material property map, two of which are very elementary and two are more uh, to, to fake additional effects onto it. And that is metallicity and roughness. So metallicity basically physically is the parameter of how mobile electrons in the material are. If you have a metal, iron, they are very mobile, and that gives you very glossy reflections and so on. But if you have plastic or ceramics, this is the electrons are very immobile, and you get something that has entirely different reflection properties. And the second one is roughness, which, of course, you can imagine a polished material reflects light in a very different way than, um, um, well, uh, a rough one. So this is not directly the same as the exponent that we used before for the Blin Fong shading. Um, but, but all of these are on a scale from 0 to 1. So metallicity goes from very metallic to not metallic, uh, metallic at all. Roughness goes from not rough as, uh, at all to, well, but more or less, this is so rough that scattering is independent of direction. And then we have the two parameters, cavity, which is more or less pre-baked ambient occlusion or some way to, to tell this is shadowed, by the way. And then reflectivity, which is more or less an artist parameter to, if your reflection stuff doesn't look good, um, select how much of your lighting is coming from, from image-based lighting, which we'll have later on. Um, just to, to show these parameters in action, this is a two-dimensional map, basically, of metallicity and roughness. So you have uh, very non-rough materials here, very rough materials up there, and you have metals here on the left and non-metals there on the right. And you can imagine this is a very, very polished metal sphere, whereas on the other side, it is a very, very polished ceramic or plastic sphere. And then as you go up in roughness, you get um, all of these look like different sorts of metal. I mean, this could be, for example, I don't know, beryllium with this color and this roughness. And then as you go over here, you have the cheap China plastics that you buy electronics from. And at the end, you have very, very rough and very, very uh, non-metallic materials like, like this rock, for example. This would be a good example for that. OK. Now, um, we had this equation before that uh, uh, just gave us light by we have our input color, and then we use this exponent thing, and this gives us a result in blind form. This gets much more complicated when we go to um, physically based shading. And we take this b-directional radiance uh, distribution function um, that basically says how much of the light comes to our viewer and depends on all these vectors, the light direction, our normal direction, our viewing direction, the reflected direction of the light, and the half vector, which is the basically halfway between these two. And, and they get into these terms, and now we're going to go step by step through each of them to explain what they are and what good approximations to them are. 
So we start with the D, which I'm not sure if this, the letter D there stands for anything. This is uh, the, um, uh, basically the, the term that gives you how how is the scatter? How does the scattering of the surface itself? This is a geometric parameter. How is the scattering of the surface itself affecting your light propagation? Um, now, of, uh, as you may know, in this in this Bing form model, you just assume if you hit a surface that has some directions or some normal, uh, you assume you hit it and it gets reflected by Snell's law. But in real life surface texture, you don't have a perfectly flat surface. But what you have is maybe scratches on it, maybe molecular structures or dust on it. So you have what's called micro facets. And there's this um, paper by Trowbridge and Wrights where they actually go ahead and um, model random fluctuations of surfaces and scratches and these kind of things and do a statistical model of how would light be scattered when hitting a randomly scratched surface. Uh, that gives a hilariously complex formula at the end, uh, which is basically impossible to use in, in any real-time application. Then they go ahead and do a very crude approximation to it, which they call G GGX. And that goes into this function, and I think we have it. OK, here, here's um, a comparison. If you have the Blin Fong model, you just say, yeah, I have a specular spot with this exponent. You get this spot, which is really just a spot. But in an actual physical material where I have scratches, you also get more reflectivity outside the area, because simply some scratches will be directed in your direction. And it, give, it looks more natural. It has this longer tail of reflections. And if you look at actual physical materials, if you just look at the ground here, you'll see there's no round spot where light reflects, but you actually get long tails and a little bit of reflectivity from everywhere. So um, the code for that thing is on the next slide. It's actually not that complicated. I mean, they basically fitted numbers and parameters to uh, uh, get this distribution function modeled. And this is something that you can easily run on a GPU without much problems. There's no complicated arithmetic uh, function in there. Um, uh, we will have a lot more code in the coming slides, and most of the time I will just skip through it quickly or even skip over it. It's just that Beryl wanted to make sure that for everything we explained here, there's actual working source code on the slides. So uh, don't, don't be scared if we have five slides coming up with uh, a huge amounts of source code that we just skipped to. They're more here for completeness. We're not going to talk through all of them. Yeah, so that was the D term, and then we have the F term. The F term is uh, not a material property. The F term is a purely electromagnetic thing. How does light wave that act, interacts with matter get reflected? So if you look at the material head on and it gets reflected, it gets reflected completely. But if you have a material where your light wave hits at a shallow angle, some of it will be scattered or absorbed in the material and only a part of it will be reflected. That's called the Fresnel term. Again, if you want to do this physically correct, you have to solve an elliptic integral, and you can't do that in real time. So there's the approximate, approximation of the paper from Schlick that basically everybody uses. Um, if you go to the next slide. Oh, OK, this is, this is how basically this uh, thing looks. The x-axis is uh, your uh, dot product between your uh, viewing vector and your normal vector. Uh, N and N and L, right? Oh, the light vector and, uh, and the normal vector. So if you uh, have light shining straight onto a surface reflecting into your eye, it gets reflected 100%. But as the angle gets more and more shallow, less and less light actually gets reflected. And um, the, the slick approximation to that, again, is relatively easy. Um, so um, yeah, the, the, the paper reference is here. Uh, this, again, was approximated by a relatively simple formula, which is good enough, which definitely looks good enough to uh, have a realistic scattering thing. And then there's the G function, which is called geometric shadowing. Again, an approximation by, by Schlick from the same paper. Uh, and simply the fact that if you use a micro facet model for, for your D and you say your reflection is not just based on the flat surface, then you also have to take into account if you have small ridges and groves on your surface and you look at it from an angle, these ridges and groves will cast shadows on the surface itself. So you have to have this additional term that basically gives you how much light um, simply gets shadowed from the roughness of the surface itself, which belongs together with the D. I mean, there's also a GGX thing for that, um, but there is an easier approximation for, uh, for uh, by Schlick, which gives um, almost the same results. I think we have slides coming up that compare the two. Um, there is the Smith GGX thing, which um, is one approximation, of course. Um, uh, but the slick thing is easier to evaluate, and you can see that the difference between them never is really large, especially if you go to uh, lower and lower roughnesses. These things um, lie basically on top of each other. Yeah, this is 0 0.5, and then 
0 0.25, and I think for 0 0.1, they basically match exactly. So uh, this can be a trade-off you can use, since the, the, the visual, visual difference isn't actually that large. Um, I think the next slide compares the actual co source code complexity. I mean, it's also not a big difference in complexity, but this one is just a couple of additional sub uh, subtractions. There you have at least the uh, square root and some more uh, divisions happening. But yeah, it's a choice you can make. OK, now we've got all these terms together. Um, this is how this um, shading function actually looks like if you use it to shade the light for one pixel coming from light, one light source. So this basically is what replaces your exponent calculation um, from the Blinthorn model. As you can see, it does look a bit more complex. It has a lot more parameters, especially um, you um, have the different colors and the uh, different material properties that we spoke about before coming in. But the visual result, I think, um, definitely uh, well, justifies the use of this more complicated uh, approach. So this is uh, the, the the previous slide was the um, version where you have one direction for the light source uh, specular component and diffuse component, but these can actually have different components. If you, for example, think of a daylight scene and you have the sun as your very bright specular light source, you have one direction, but your average diffuse light is coming from your entire sky dome, so that might have a different direction. So you may want to use uh, a version um, where these um, vectors are in looking different directions. Well, this will be important later on for the skylight uh, simulation in Superlighter. Again, I'm not going to go through all the details uh, of the source code. OK, now um, next up, uh, this was now the formula for if you have one light source illuminating one pixel. But you don't always just have one light source. You can, of course, sum over multiple of them. But in a real life scenario, you have basically light coming from all sorts of directions. So instead of iterating through light sources, what you do is to use image-based lighting. So um, formally, oh yeah, again, this is uh, based on what the Unreal Engine 4 does. Um, what, what you do instead of just saying light sources are here and there and there, you have some sort of image. So for example, a texture, a cube map, or some other representation saying how, is lights, how are light sources distributed in your environment. One way to do this is to place cube maps into your scene. So when, if I'm standing here, I take a cube map picture of my surrounding, I use that to illuminate myself. Um, the, the difference is that um, Whereas the, the Unreal Engine basically only uses cube maps, Superlighter can use cube maps and also equi rectu equi rectangular environment maps. That is simply the environment pol in polar co coordinates mapped onto one 2D texture, which has the advantage, A, that you don't have to fiddle around with cube map coordinate uh, uh, problems, and B, has the advantage that on mobile platforms, cube map smoothing may not be available and it's much easier. So the 64K from yesterday from Barrow, that was using only these equi rectangular simply because the tool doesn't have any handling code for uh, cube maps in there. So what are we doing now? We have this, this big integral here that is I mean, formally, we have this big integral of all our light sources. And this f term is what the, the big formula we had before the, with the, all the d, f, and g components. For each of these light uh, sources, we have to um, use this uh, uh, f term and also the, the Lambertian theta, so simply the, the angle at which the light um, hits, your, uh, hits your object, and integrate over all of them to get a complete integrated lightning for one pixel. And now there's one thing people do, which is the most horrible mathematical trick. Each of you that has any formal training in mathematics will now scream and go to the ceiling. We say the sum over these products is the same as the pro product of the sums. This is called the split sum approximation, and it's blatantly wrong. <laughs> However, it turns out that the visual difference is so small that everybody uses this. And it has the big advantage that suddenly the things here are basically constants. You can, uh, they only depend on your v and your lk vectors, and you can pre-calculate them and put them into a lookup texture. So you just say, OK, um, we use these two coordinates as our texture coordinates. We pre-calculate them, then we just do linear interpolation in this texture, and it gets much faster than actually calculating all these f functions that we had before. And uh, then, yeah, I guess. That allows for much faster access, and then we only have to care about actually summing up, up our environment around us. 
Yeah, so this is now, again, code that I'm not going to explain in detail, how to generate this lookup function. This is basically the functions we had before, the, um, the G function, the GGX, the, um, yeah, this is the important sampling of the GGX distribution, and we have a Fresnel term in there and so on, but yeah. <laughs> This is for, for those of you who actually want to uh, implement something similar in their own code. OK, now um, the second thing, after we've now separated this, this sum in two parts, is to look at the first sum. How do we actually get the information about all the lights in our environment? Because even if we have a cube map or a texture map of our environment, you only have you know, one texture per direction. So you still have to sum over it to get all the directions that may influence your light source. Um, Instead, what you can do is take the texture, take the sharp image of the texture and blur it to, with the correct blur kernel to see how light from there affects the pixel that looks here and the other way around. Um, this is one part where, where cube maps can cause a problem, especially on mobile devices, because WebGL and OpenGL ES does not allow you seamless cube maps, so you will have artifacts on, your, on the corners of your cubes, and it's all going to be very unpretty. Um, the 2D textures don't have this problem, so this is why there's more uh, the more work went into using them in Superlighter by Beira. And so, um, yeah, I guess the, the next slide will show us what we're doing here. This is now the, the first part of the split sum approximation. This one has to be approximated by using MIP mapping. And yeah, um, again, it's a, a very complicated piece of code. The important part is that you have this GGX distribution of your, of your individual lights contribution due to the scattering. This is, again, this the cook torrens microfacet model. Um, and um, instead of before we had the, 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 uh, the function giving you the shape of this peak, here we have a function that actually creates a distribution of random samples around your direction to just sample the environment of every point and uh, yeah, give them the correct, the, the, the correct uh, weight to blur your cube maps using exactly this distribution, not just um, a, a Gaussian kernel, which would, again, not give you the, the right reflectivity distribution. But you create a, a distribution with which you blur your cube or your environment map. And that is then, in the next step, um, being called here to collect samples of the environment and to you build your MIP map hierarchy, basically. Yeah, and then you have this, um, this environment map that you've built, and you use it with your MIP map index based on your material roughness. If you have a very sharp material, you look at your sharp environment map, because you have basically a clean reflection. But if you have, if you have a very rough material, you look into a very coarse MIP map, and you just say, I want all light information from this hemisphere, and that, that's what influences me. And then you use your pre-calculated BRDF this f function texture and multiply the two and you get your results. So instead of doing this exponential thing you did before, you, did two you do two texture lookups and you get very nice um, physically based shading based on your materials. Now, the next thing you have to keep in mind, and those of you who've seen, I think, yesterday Zavi's talk will be very aware of that, is that um, if you do physically based shading, you basically want to uh, work with linear lightnesses, so basically something proportional to the count of photons that hits your surface. But uh, since the human eye does not perceive something linear in the count of photons, normally um, you're storing information in a, in a gamma, uh, well, in a gamma space. So if you go to the next slide, um, if you have a linear number of, I mean, if your number of photons increases, the actual light that the human eye sees only grows as this, well, um, it is a, a very much slowly growing function over a large magnitude of values. And it's normally approximated by using a x to the sec two point second uh, uh, square root, so 1 over 2.2 .2 power uh, law. So if you have more, twice the number of photons come up, you only have um, 1 to the power of 1 over 2.2, .2, the visual impression of brightness coming up. And this is being used in computer graphics by using the inverse curve, x to the power of 2.2, .2, to store your information. So you, don't, you need less bits to store the stuff here than you use to store the stuff here, simply because if you have only an 8-bit storage target, you would waste all your information on the bright stuff, and your, your low-intensity um, stuff would not really look good. Example, if you have a camera, like a normal CCD, that is basically a linear photon counter. Um, and you take a photo of Bero's dog, it looks like this. Um, but if you then 
treat this gamma wrongly and you, you just use this this x value in, in, in shaders that are not aware of it, you will get um, something like this. This is too bright, because somewhere in your processing chain it will probably be assumed that um, the gamma value of 2.2 has to be used in it, and the resulting thing will come out too bright. Or if it's the other way around, you overcorrect your gamma, it will look too dark. But what you really want to do is to make sure that you uh, have an idea. Are you currently dealing in linear space? Or are you working in something that is proportional to your photon count? Or are you uh, in perceptual space? Are you dealing with something that your actual eye works with? Yeah, so these are the, the three uh, possibilities of, of functions that you can have. Remember back at the start um, when I was talking about how Superlighter looked in the beginning, you had textures that were basically representations of this pixel should look like this to the human eye. So things were stored in the perceptual um, space. However, we want to do physically based shading, so we have to always convert colors that come in from a perceptual space into linear space first, and then at the end, when our final result has been rendered, we have to convert it back into the perceptual space to be able to get something that looks like the thing the human eye expects. And yeah, you just have to make sure that if you go from one to the next, you have to either use gamma of 2.2 or gamma uh, of 0.45 to, yeah, to convert back and forth. Uh, yeah, in one example, uh, uh, monitors, or also the, the projector here, um, they basically take a, a signal. If it's a VGA signal, it's an analog, um, yeah, basically an analog voltage signal. And the voltage does not specify linear light as it comes out, but there's this factor 2.2 already in there. So um, there's a beam slide there that gives you monitor calibration where you can actually see the gamma factor of uh, the beam, which is very, very close to 2.2 here, which is excellent. Um, and you have to make sure that if you have calculated in linear light, do the um, 0 0.45 uh, the power to your final result so that when the monitor corrects with 2.2, the result will again be linear. Yeah, so if you have a, an actual linear camera and get linear counts, you don't have to do anything when you store it, and then you only have to do your 2.2 at the end. Um, but if you have a consumer camera that, of course, also given that everybody normally just wants perceptual information, that's the 0 0.45 for you, then you have to correct at the end to get the, the correct output. Yeah, that one, we, I think we have that, right? OK, now, um, since people have always been using textures, as this is how the pixel is supposed to look like, um, everything in uh, all rendering engines assumes that it's a perceptual space that stuff is being stored in, unless you explicitly tell it to. So if you say, by the way, this is sRGB uh, color space, and you probably want to use a, at least 16-bit, or I mean, if you, if you can, something like 10, 11-bit um, uh, color space if you want to store linear information, then you can tell it, by the way, OpenGL, this is linear, don't do any corrections, and so on. And then as, as you, further on you do post-processing, you have to keep in mind, is your post-processing algorithm assuming linear space, or is it assuming perceptual space? So the uh, tone mapping operator we're now going to talk about actually has this uh, uh, power, this 2.2 this mapping in there already. Yeah, uh, of course, um, yeah, that's, uh, I think that, that was on the previous slide as well. You have to make sure that you use uh, a storage format that actually has enough space to store linear light if you want to store linear light. Um, because uh, if you only use 8 bits, then you will either lose the top bright colors or the dark colors, and everything will look like that. So which brings us to tone mapping, which is um, now the process of, um, in the end, getting your linear light into something that your eye recognizes. So in real life, um, the human eye can uh, discern brightnesses of nine orders of magnitude. When you go outside at night and you look at the stars, the starlight is only a small amount of photons hitting your, hitting your eye every second. But if you go outside during daytime and you basically look at the sun, which you shouldn't, but if you do it, you get 10 to the order of nine or billions of photons hitting your eye every second. And the human eye is able to compensate for all of that. Um, even at one single given moment, like right here, we still have a, a order, three orders of magnitude of brightness. So I guess the, the black thing there is three orders of magnitude less than, the, for example, the projector shining into my eye right now. And still I'm able to, to my, my eye is able to compensate. The, the iris of my eye opens and closes dynamically. The receptors in the eye uh, react non-linearly to, to map this uh, to colors. Now, if you want to do the same, 
in a computer, you have the problem that your computer, your display typically only has eight bits of, of well, per, uh, brightness per color, or even less if you have a consumer display. Um, and you have to somehow still get the same visual impression across. So you basically have to simulate some part of the human, uh, of the human viewing system that does this mapping from high dynamic range to low dynamic range before you display stuff on the screen. So that's what you need a tone mapping operator for. And there's different categories of, of tone mapping operators, some that really emulate, try to emulate the biochemistry in the human eye, some that try to em, uh, emulate CCD detectors and cameras, and some that try to emulate the behavior of film. If you want to have something that looks like a Hollywood movie, you should use a filmic tone mapping operator. And the Jim Heji filmic tone mapping operator is rather simple, but rather efficient one. And that's what um, Bero decided to use for this uh, game, since the, the plan is to have it look like, well, like film quality stuff. Anyway. Anyway, and there's, there's about two dozen different form tone mapping operators. If you just Google for them, you get a huge list. They try to do different parts of different perceptual systems and um, choose your, your own one. We'll, we're going to limit ourselves here to this Jim Heiji operator. So um, this is what the code looks like. It's not very complicated. It gets in the color, and this color is in linear space, so this is actually something proportional to a photon count, and then maps it via this function with lots of parameters that have just been tuned based on measurements of film um, to calculate what is the brightness impression that comes out at the end on the fo photographic film. Or, I mean, if you have a visual term operator, something like what is the perceptual information that reaches the human brain. Um, and it's important that here, this one already does the correction. I mean, this has been fitted in a way that a linear value comes in and the actual perceptual value comes out. So you don't need to do this power correction explicitly in this operator. Uh, the, in the, in the one we're using in, um, in the Mercury tool chain is actually working a bit differently, and we still have to do the, um, the uh, power thing. We're using the one from Uncharted 2. Um, additionally, um, in, the, in the code, there's still the automatic exposure adaptation. Basically, this is the process of the human eye opening and closing the iris, or if you're using a camera, an automatic gain control in the camera that um, opens or closes the, uh, the, the, the shutter, or changes the intensity, the, the, um, the sensitivity of uh, the, the detector. And this is simply being modeled by um, taking the, the light, the, the rendered image as it comes in, building a MIP map permit for it, using the coarsest MIP map there is, which basically is just one by one pixel left, which basically gives you the average brightness. And then using this to um, do an exponentially weighted well, you had an exponentially uh, uh, weighted average of the last couple of frames to, say, uh, to see. I'm now looking at right, uh, light source. I'm closing my iris. And over a uh, determined um, amount of time, it, it corrects for the brightness changes. Yeah, so in uh, the 64K, or if you're rendering a demo instead of a game, you, of course, know beforehand what you're going to see in the future. Uh, so there's no automatic exposure adaptation in there. But instead, it's just pre-baked and stored as a, as a, well, as a, as a curve, as an uh, automated ad automation envelope. Since um, if you know that you're going to be looking at the sun in the next five frames, you can already store, OK, now the, the iris ha has to close. But this is, of course, easier, because you don't need to do this MIP mapping and uh, compute chain calculation. But um, for an interactive application, of course, you can't know before and what you're going to look at, so you have to do this somehow. OK, next part. Everybody uh, in the demo scene uh, seems to hate Bloom, but it is a part of the optical processes that happen when you look at, the, at things. I mean, in a computer graphics thing, you have a mathematical expression mapping your geometry onto a screen space. And you have one coordinate maps to one other coordinate, and this is the pixel you have to draw. But in an actual, in the human eye, you, if light comes in, it can get scattered in impurities in your, in your eyeball. Or even in a, in a camera, you have imperfectly created lenses. You have um, diffraction of the finite size lenses. You may have dirt on them. So what actually happens is that sharply um, focused light points get um, spread out by this point spread function. If you only had diffraction, this would be uh, an iry disk. So uh, it would form a central bright spot and then some concentric circles around it. But this is only for a point-based light source. In real life, you, of course, always have extended light sources somewhat. So the iry disks overlap, and you get more continuous distributions. And scattering and dirt and all that also gives you more or less maybe a Gaussian profile. So what you do, instead of um, convoluting your input image, convolving your input image with this, you use a Gaussian um, approximation to diffusion and say your incoming light diffuses outward somewhat. 
Uh, additionally, in modern CCDs, of course, you have the process that simply light hitting your detector excites electrons that can go to your neighboring pixels, and then you get this bloom effect of CCDs. So you should really do bloom if you want to have a proper representation of bright things. If you just have a white pixel on screen, it doesn't look like a bright thing. But if you have a bright pixel that shines over its environment, then you have the same impression that the human eye gives you of bright objects. Um, yeah, so uh, that's why I said the individual rings aren't normally discernible because they're finite sized light source. So we're just going to use a continuous smooth kernel here. Uh, and you may know this scene from, from yesterday, 64K of Pharaoh. You have this very bright statue standing in the temple, and the environment around this is very dark. And um, in order to, to give this bloom impression, what you do is first you uh, only look at the parts of the image that are bright. So you do a thresholding uh, pass where you um, uh, take your, your input thing that you value the. Uh, you, you take your input parameter in linear light space, where brightness goes from zero to infinity, basically. You just say a value, OK, everything below this I don't care about. I want to only blur bright things, or I only want to put bloom on bright things. So you cut off everything beneath that. Then you blur your things with your blur kernel, which can be very large if you want to, half your screen size, for example, is what we use in, in uh, our Mercury demos. In the, um, in the super lighted tool, it's, it's two separate blur, blur passes in X and Y direction of Gaussian blurs, I think with 17 taps. And then you add this back on top of the original image. And if we now compare it to the previous one, to the original input, this doesn't look like a bright object. This looks like a normal white object. But once you add the um, blur on top of it, you immediately have the impression of this is something that is glowing. The um, Mercury tool chain, by the way, does not do the cutoff. We just um, have an enormously large uh, scale of, of brightnesses going from typically zero for dark to about 20,000 for sunlight. So um, things that are around one in brightness just simply don't contribute at all. We just add the, the blur on top of it without any thresholding. But that's a matter of taste. And then um, we, we go into even more cheesy territory. But that is still something, if you want to go for a, for a filmic look, um, lens flares. Uh, in, a, in an actual camera, you don't just have a lens focusing your light on your film, and that's it. But you actually have an optical system that consists of multiple lenses. Light that comes in, where we may have one lens here and one lens there, light that comes in does not just go through and go on your film, but some of it will be reflected in the first one, then on bounce of the second one, and maybe bounce of the wall, and then hit your film at some other point. So it will create, um, well, fake images of bright objects. Camera makers try to minimize this effect, of course, so they are not as bright as the original image that comes in, but they can still be very noticeable, especially if you have a very high image contrast, if you're looking at very bright things. Yeah, um, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and do actual lens, lens simulations and trace light through your optical system and do very convoluted things to, to get real lens flares. The problem, however, is A, this is not very fast. There are some uh, uh, people at the Max Planck Institute in, I think it's in Zabrücken here, actually, um, that are uh, trying these uh, lens simulations. The problem is A, it is not very fast, B, it is very complicated, and C, it is patented. Now, of course, as a demo scene, you don't really have to care about software patents. You're not using it for commercial applications anyway, so you don't need a license to use it. But um, if you do not just write demos for fun like I do, then you may be, you may have problems with that, and also just for ethical reasons, software patients just suck. So don't, don't just don't enable these people. So um, yeah, we, we uh, do need an alternative, given that um, Superlighter is uh, by uh, is produced by something like a companyish uh, construct, Cherry, Cherry Darling, um, and there's now uh, just a it's it's not physically based by itself. What's happening here, but it is empirically motivated, let's say, um, to 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 give the more or less correct impression of lens flares. Um, the, the algorithm basically consists of four stages. The down sample and threshold thing is basically what we did before for the blur itself anyway. Um, then uh, lens flare features are being generated from this down sampled and thresholded map. And then the entire thing is blurred and added over the, the original image again. So if you have a bright spot on your image somewhere here, and it goes through your optical system. It mostly stays more or less on the optical axis of this object. So it goes through the center of the image. And then depending on the amount of lenses and the sort of lenses you have in the system, you have multiple mirror fake ghost features 
somewhere along uh, the optical image of the uh, the optical axis of the object. And if you have an object right spot in the center of your of your image, it will probably produce since the the entire optical setup is probably spherically symmetric, you will get something like a ring feature. But if it's off center here, you will probably get something that is more half moon shaped on the other side. And that is exactly now what we are trying to 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 model um, in in the semi empirical thing. Um, we say that. Our lenses are not perfectly uh, made. They may have not exactly round shapes and um, different sorts of dirt fluctuations, these kind of things, diffractions. So we have we get gen pre generate this noise based texture that modulates our lens flares. And we also assume that there's dirt on the lens itself, which is modeled by just creating this noise texture, which modulates our, our input. So we, when a bright thing is here, we modulate it with more or less strength so um, that it doesn't look so, so very homogeneous. And then the fact that there's diffraction happening, and there may be uh, coatings on the lenses, and everything can be very colorful in, in second order reflections in an optical system, um, is not properly done in the spectral modeling. But we uh, uh, just use gradient image like this to, um, well, to, to map lens flare colors um, as they appear on, in, in the end on the center uh, of the film. So putting it all together, we have our image. This is also from the 64K yesterday. We have a very dark space. And we have a very bright sun uh, light source. Uh, we again downsample and threshold it. So only these parts of the image are bright enough to actually contribute to our lens flares. And then there's this mapping being done. For every target point, we map across the optical axis and see if there's anything bright that contributes to um, possible lens flares there. Yeah, it, it's been blurred and then the lens flares are being calculated from it. So we go from here along the optical axis, sample here, there, and there, and add the brightnesses up, and we get something like this, which corresponds to a bright, uh, pure lens flares. And then we use the two dirt uh, um, textures we had before to make it look more like something that an optical system creates. Yeah, these ones combined look like that. Yeah, and then the result again gives us something like a photon count, so it is then put into a tone mapping operator. And the final thing that comes out is our rendered image. Looks like this. So now you have an actual, I mean, before you just had a bright spot on the horizon, but now you actually have the feeling you're looking at an annoying bright sun. By having the tone mapping, by having all these things around that a bad camera would create. Um, somebody once said about the Mercury tool chain that it's the best simulation of the horribly bad Chinese consumer camera that you can get. So that is basically what we're doing here as well. Yeah, here again uh, um, uh, is the source code of it. So here you see where, the, where along the optical axis of each um, pixel we're, we're looking up, um, basically, the, the brightnesses. Yeah, and then this is the, the code that uh, combines it and finally creates um, our, our final fragment color. OK. Now, um, the things so far have been very general about all kinds of, of rendering techniques, but we are working on a racing game here. So it's very important to have motion blur or to give people a sense of speed. I mean, it's nice in all kinds of rendering contexts, but for mo a racing game, it's basically imperative to have motion blur. Now. Um, where does motion blur come from? Of course, if you're rendering an image at one point in time, you get very sharp features. Everything is at a point and gets mapped. But this is not how it works in real time. If you have a movie camera, it opens the shutter for a little bit, captures photons, closes the shutter, creates an image. Next uh, frame. But as long as the shutter is open and objects move, they, of course, will have a smeared out thing on the film. This is something that is not directly easy to do in computer graphics unless you do enormous amounts of super sampling, which we don't want to. But you can fake it. Fake it until you make it. Um, you render your normal image, but not just your normal image. You also render a Z buffer, which you do anyway if you're doing rasterizing to, to Z test polygons, and an additional buffer which contains velocity maps. So velocity is relative to the camera. If you, you can see here that, for example, the, the racer itself is standing still with regard to the camera, more or less, but the stuff around it is moving very quickly. And then you want to put this into a reconstruction filter to get, lens, uh, to get motion blur out of it. Problem is, if you want to do this at full, full resolution and sample the environment of every pixel if something is blurring into it, that is prohibitively expensive. So um, here, it's an it's a approximative um, process being used that the 
image of this velocity buffer is divided into tiles, which are then um, being uh, processed to create the maximum velocity of every tile. We just assume only the maximum velocity in every tile is important. And then look at all our neighbors to see what is the maximum overlap of that a neighbor has with us. And then we only blow based on these tiles. Because most of this image will probably more or less move in one direction anyway. This is a racing game. We have some part of the image that stands still in the center, and everything else just moves around us more or less in the same direction. So this turns out to work really well. And there is, I think, more source code coming up. Now, these are um, now, um, well, I think since we're basically 10 minutes before our <laughs> scheduled end of slot anyway, we're not going to go into too much detail of what our shapes for, for motion blur look like. But if you have detailed questions about that, talk to Bear afterwards. Um, the, basically, the uh, important thing is that you can um, you, you calculate your, your velocity buffer simply while rendering by, by looking at, I mean, you have your 3D objects, you know where they're moving, you project them into screen space anyway, so you can use, use the same matrices to calculate your velocity buffer. And then you use this small shader to go over your tiles and uh, iterate through the tiles and just find your maximum magnitude, so your maximum direction. And then you ask your neighbors what is your, max, what is your velocity and find the neighbor that basically blurs into you the most. And then store that into your output variable. And then for every tile you have, you know what, what neighbor is blurring into you, you know in what direction it is blurring. So then it is just a one dimensional blur. You look at your neighbor and you, you well, calculate a blur based on that direction. Which is, yeah, a bit of source code, but you know, you, once you've implemented a blur, you know how this works. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, this is the optimized version that Vero wrote, which is incredibly unreadable, but faster, um, if, you, if you really want to, to know that. <laughs> Now, this is not the first, the, the only kind of uh, uh, blur that's in there. I mean, yesterday in the demo, you ha saw that there's quite extensive use of depth of field, which is, again, an artifact of using a finite-sized camera instead of a pinhole or a finite-sized eyeball. If m most of you will probably have eyes, so you know how it is that when you wake up in the morning and you're drunk, you don't see very clearly. And the, the reason for that is that your, eye, uh, your aperture is actually finite. So light coming in on one side of your eye and light coming in the other side of the eye get mapped to different points. This is, again, nothing you directly do in computer graphics unless you super sample your, your, the shape of your aperture, which you probably don't want to because it, computing time just goes to the roof. Instead, um, this is being done as a post-processing pass. You have your depth stored anyway, so you might just blur it selectively based on that. And there are two methods. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, first of all, the, your, your circle of confusion, so how big does a pixel have to be blurred, can be calculated um, in two ways. The, we Mercury people just fake it. We say, well, it's more or less, we have one point where it's sharp, and then away from it, it just gets more blurry. Um, but uh, this is the proper way to do it. You have your lens parameters, like you have your focal plane, you have your field of view, you have your focal length of your lens, and all of this goes into this formula to create your uh, depth of field. I personally think if you're doing something um, like artist, like art, like demo scene, you can just select uh, uh, focus plane and some, some parameter to say how blurry it is. But once you actually want to do something physical, you probably need to go into modeling the lens parameters here. It's not a complicated expression. It's just, you know, you need to look it up. And then there's, there's two ways to actually do the blurring. The first uh, variant is um, a separable, separable blur. I think this was originally invented by the people of the Frostbite engine. If, if you go ahead, one slide. Um, the, the um, observation was that you can easily do blurs of, of well, rhombi, of parallelograms in screen space. You can do one dimensional blur in this direction, take the result, and blur it in the second direction, any arbitrary direction, um, to, to get like a blur with this kernel. This is what people use for box blurs, and this is, uh, this is two linear processes. Um, now, you can actually take this to combine them to create a hexagonal shape. You cannot really get any other than hexagonal or square shapes based of, on this linear process. But at least that's something. That is something that people, well, that has probably been overused by a certain demo group. Um, so it's falling out of fashion. But that is one way to do it. Um, has the advantage that um, as your size of your, your unsharp part grows, it only grows linearly in computation time. And um, if you read the, the paper for them, it's actually possible to do these blurs 
two at a time to not have to um, uh, do all the three things separately, all the three parts of your hexagonal. But you can actually do multiple in one pass, and you only have to do three linear passes over your space to get the hexagons. I think there's source code coming up, exactly. So you, um, you do gather your, your depth data, and your, um, you, you look at your neighbors, what am I blurring over? And then the next pass, you, you can see that um, these are only doing one for loop with, in this case, eight samples in each direction. And the next uh, pass basically looks the same except in different direction. So you have these, these rhombi forming. In the third pass, you combine them to get your color at the end. You, you mix between these three, um, well, the three rhombi making up your hexagon. Now, the disadvantages in this method is in the first pass, you, you blur a sharp image with sharp depths into a line. And then the second pass, when you want to do your parallelogram, you are blurring something that is already blurred. Your depth information actually has already been washed out. So whatever direction you're doing your first pass in will give you a correct circle of confusion. Your second pass already is washed out. So you get problems at corners that some directions get blurred the other, uh, differently than other directions. So there's nothing you can do in this method except use a different method. And that is the second one that has been implemented in um, uh, Superlight and also been used in 64K from yesterday. That is to directly um, do the blur by looking at your aperture shape. So it can be anything, any n-gon you want, pentagon, hexagon, heptagon, and so on. And you distribute your samples and do this lookup two-dimensionally. Um, and there's this, this nice form uh, to, to basically, if you have a distribution on a circle, you can map it to any other n-gon using this formula. By, by just saying I have n corners and I want to distort my distribution. If you go to the next slide, yeah, this is what the same thing looks like implemented in shader code. Not exactly pretty, but um, it works rather well. And here you see, this is actually a movie. You see how this distribution goes from being a spherical lens to a hexagonal lens. And the same thing can be used to use pentagons, heptagons, and so on, and be, be fancier than mercury and have different shapes for your lens layers. And, um, but as you can see, if you, if you use this, um, I think on the next slide, you'll see that here actually you have to do a two-dimensional sampling. So the problem is as your uh, lens uh, or your, your depth of field grows, uh, computational complexity goes up as n squared. So you have to take care that your, your, well, your depth of field stays small. But as long as you do that, here you don't have any artifact problems the way the linear process does. And you shouldn't be overdoing depth of field anyway. Huh, that's what I say. <laughs> OK, um, SSAO is now being skipped because A, we're very short on time, and B, there's lots of SSAO related stuff uh, on the internet and also in. Um, OK, yeah. Um, uh, there, there's lots of SSAO stuff also in other talks from, from previous um, break, uh, uh, revisions, I think. Next thing we're going to talk about is order independent transparency. You probably know that you can render transparent stuff on a GPU, but just you know, when you render it, you instead of setting it as your pixel color, you edit and edit and edit and edit. But that is um, a problem if you want something that is not just adding brightness, but maybe shadowing the stuff behind it. Because then you either have to order your transparent things from bottom to front to get proper shading done on them, or you're out of luck. Um, there's a new method that's now possible with recent GPUs called order independent transparency, where instead of rendering them at a random order or ordering them beforehand, when you render, you don't create one color value. But what you create is you create a list of your color contributions to every pixel. And only at the end, you go through this list and create a, a final color value by, by combining all of them. So this is implemented here. And it is using a trick called weighted blended order independent transparency, where already you do actually calculate the sum of them. But you also calculate the, the, the z range and the, the number of samples that you have and use them to combine something that is not exactly, but almost exactly order independent transparency. And already creates a, a, li a sorted list for you. So there's source code here. Um, yeah, this, this is being done um, with 32-bit atomics on modern GPUs. The problem, uh, of course, is if you want to create a list on a GPU, you have to do memory management. And if you do memory management, you, in parallel threads, you have locking problems, unless you use atomic counters. And this is actually 
um, available online on, on GitHub in the repository. So that is uh, a fancy way to create your, uh, your lists in GPU memory for the order independent transparency. Lots of code. This is the example of the code that we just skipped to. Yeah, um, well, another fancy feature that we're not going to talk about in lots of details, anti-aliasing. I mean, um, uh, if you render with pixels, you'll always, uh, or if you render with rasterizing, you always have the problem that your triangles end somewhere, and you either have to um, super sample them to actually make sure that on the corners of your, uh, of your triangles you get the proper information, average information for every pixel, or you do something like FXIA where you, uh, as a post-processing pass, blur your, your edges to get a more or less realistic or less staircase look. But yeah, use, use the search engine of your choice. There's lots of papers written about that. Now and now that the time's almost up, but we can go over uh, time. We can go to the really interesting stuff. So far, this has all been just you know implementing uh, physical, physically based ray tracing, physically based rendering techniques that other people have also done in Unreal Engine 4. Um, but there are actually methods to go beyond that and to not need to pre-calculate cube maps or light probes in a way. So um, yeah, first thing that, that Barrow went beyond with is uh, the shadow maps, the sample distribution shadow maps, which of course, I mean, you've seen the, the, the uh, video in the beginning. The shadow, the, if you have a floating spacecraft racer, you need to cast a, a shadow under, view, uh, under you. And um, uh, well, the, the classical method to render a shadow map is to go into the position of your light source, basically render your scene, and instead of writing out uh, color information from the view of your light source, you write depth information. You just render your scene one time, you know where your geometry is, and then you test against that to see if you're in light or in shadow um, once you render the actual scene. Um, but that has the disadvantage that you need to choose a resolution for your rendering to, to actually be able to say, well, I what is my pixel that I actually test against? And you know, there's a trade-off between using too much memory and having crappy shadows. But then you can use cascaded shadow maps. And uh, I think there's a nice plot that shows how this works. Um, instead of um, just choosing one shadow map, you have a, a set of them uh, along the view of Frostrom from your light source. Uh, you first do a compute shader based test on what is your approximate minimum maximum Z value that you will have for your shadows. And then you distribute you, uh, your, your shadow maps in them. Exactly, uh, the, the uh, light space bounds are, are, correct, uh, are calculated beforehand. And then you create a bunch of cascades, a bunch of them, not very high resolution individually, but um, the ones closest to the viewer or the, the, the ones um, with the most relevance are highest resolution, the ones further away are less high resolution. And um, using, using axis aligned uh, shadow maps gives the advantage that there's no flickering and no uh, problems with, um, yeah, well, with shadow map resolution being insufficient, while at the same time still being space efficient. An alternative, of course, to um, doing shadows via shadow maps by calculating what the light source sees is to actually ray trace shadows. And um, as I said, this is where it gets interesting, because if you're doing rasterizing, how do you do also ray tracing at the same time? And if you're not writing a 4K or 64K intro and specifying your geometry as implicit functions, you have to store your triangles in a, in a data structure. So what Barrow did is actually implement BVH trees, so boundary volume hierarchy trees on the GPU, stores the vertex information there as well to be able, for every pixel that is being hit, check if it's in the shadow or not by doing an, a, a light propagation uh, through this tree. Now the thing when you're doing when you're storing your geometry as a, as a tree, basically as an oct tree, a boundary value hierarchy, is you're marching through this tree to see if you hit something. So you have to go from one leaf of the tree to maybe an entirely different leaf of the tree. Um, and then there are some acceleration data structures that help you with this. Otherwise, you'd have to, um, if you transverse from space here to space here, you have to go up to the root and go down again and do very, uh, things that are very, very inefficient on GPUs. But what you can do is store skip lists. If your example, for example, your tree looks like this, and you're, you're moving through it with a ray from here to there, you would have to first find A, then go up, find H, go up again, find Z. 
But what helps you are skip lists. You just say for every node on your tree what is the neighbors that can possibly be of relevance to me. So for example, if I'm going from A to H to Z, all I have to do is follow the skip lists for the neighbors. I go from A to H to, well, Z. Um, I think, is the link missing? Ah, yeah, you, you have to go one up, but you don't have to actually go all the way through your tree, which accelerates your traversal of the structure. So that is implemented in Superlighter as well. And this is not a small piece of code, as you can imagine, with uh, complicated memory management on the GPU. And um, then, then it gets more interesting if you want to uh, render skylight scenes. I mean, of course, you can just calculate the number of light probes or cube maps for different times of day. But you can't really smoothly blend between morning, noon, and night without it looking somewhat unrealistic. What you want to do is some atmospheric simulation. Actually, clouds and the blue sky and all that are the same process. Physically, um, you have two scattering processes at work. One is called Rayleigh scattering, and it's being uh, uh, created by particles that are much smaller than the light source of your light. For example, simply oxygen molecules and stuff in your sky. And the other one is called mean scattering that is produced by particles larger than the um, well, then, then your light wavelength, such as water droplets or dust in the atmosphere. And they have different scattering prob uh, probabilities. Rayleigh scattering scatters more or less forward and backward with the uh, same probability, with me scattering <laughs> primarily fo uh, uh, does forward scattering, so has a strong um, lobe forward. Uh, the thing is that Rayleigh scattering very strongly depends on, on uh, your lambda, your, your wavelength of your light. To, it's to the fourth power, which is the reason why blue light gets scattered much more strongly. And this is the reason why the sky is blue. But mean scattering does not really have a strong um, wavelength dependence, which is why clouds are white, but the sky is blue. And both of these uh, processes have to be simulated if you want to have proper looking um, sky in, in your system. And both of the uh, scattering probability functions are, are displayed here. And um, now, how do you actually do this in, in practice to, to do a scattering simulation? I think this is the next slide, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, of course, you have to, to, uh, to model what does your atmosphere look like? What is the density of scattering particles that you have? And um, the, the simplest model that is entirely sufficient for computer graphics uh, uh, purposes is that of an exponential stratified atmosphere. You say you give the density at, at sea level, and you just say it exponentially decreases as you go up, which is more than good enough for our purposes. And what you specify is the scale height h, which is the height at which the density, the scattering density increases to 1 over e. And the, the uh, physical parameters that we have, uh, that, that are typically being used for Earth, I mean, apart from radius of the Earth and so on, um, you have a scale height for your atmospheric density, so your oxygen molecules of about 8,000 meters. That is more or less the height of the Mount Everest. So if you're top of Mount Everest, you maybe have half as much oxygen in, your, um, in the area around you, in the air around you, so that's realistic. But the mean scattering, so the density of um, water droplets and of dust, is actually has a much smaller um, scale height. As you can see, if you fly an airplane, as soon as you're on 2,000 meters altitude, most of the clouds are below you, and there's not much coming above it. So these have two different scale heights. And then, um, okay, yeah. as, you, as you ray march this, you actually, uh, in, in practice, you want to march along this ray. But for every point in the ray, you have to actually go towards your light source and see if there's something that has scattered in between. So suddenly, your ray marching becomes an already expensive problem going to one direction, an even more expensive problem going from every point to the light source, a two-dimensional problem. So this is not something you can actually do for every pixel or every frame all the time. Um, so uh, what you can instead do is um, not do it every pixel, every frame, every time, but only do it a part of your uh, pixels. So you use a biomatrix, which is basically a distribution of um, points on your, well, uh, a part, uh, every tile of your screen has, uh, has only a couple of uh, points evaluating this. And if you don't filter it, it looks like shit, like this. But if you then do a blur pass over it, it actually looks very, very decent. And you only need, I think, one fourth of the pixels are being evaluated here to create this image. And it gets a much nicer cloud um, or atmospheric fidelity. Compare on the left, if we were doing this directly on every pixel, we have to scale down our computational demands or array marching with, so the actual quality that we can get with non-interleaved samples only looks like that. 
So yeah, here we go. Here we got all the physical parameters and the code that actually does this. The noise function is simply giving our clouds. And then we use the, um, the scattering length of our, yeah, our, problem, uh, our, our cloud, our atmospheric propagation. And it's basically just a long ray marching loop on every pixel that's being hit. Okay, and now that we've got a sky shader, we also have to use this to illuminate our scene. But the, the Im image-based lighting that we explained earlier was using static light probes, like cube maps or, or 2D textures. But now our, our sky is fully dynamic. Clouds may come in and go out, so you have to do this in an interactive fashion. And instead of storing it in, in cube maps or images, um, the, the method that, uh, that Bearer used here is spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics are basically the same thing that sine and cosine are in one dimension, only on the surface of a sphere. If you go to the next image, you can actually see what they look like. So as, uh, the same way that you know a constant function is a periodic function without a periodicity, and a sine is something that wobbles in a one-dimensional space, you have a constant function is a sphere. The first the spherical harmonic is some, some of these, well, handlebar-shaped things. The next order are these very uh, weirdly shaped things. And it gets more and more complicated as you go up in higher order. If you know quantum mechanics, these will be familiar to you because they're exactly the electron orbitals of a hydrogen atom. Um, and uh, for, for Superlighter, uh, Vera decided to only use the first three orders of spherical harmonics to, to model the distribution of light coming in from different directions. Because as you go to higher orders, your memory complexity go, grows very strongly. And this turned out to be more, more than enough to give good real-time global illumination. Now, what do you do with it? You have different uh, ways to model your, your global illumination. I mean, we've had the static light probes, the, the cube maps, and so on before. You can uh, alternatively use voxels to use a voxel grid and propagate light information from one part of the image to the other. But that takes very, very large voxels and very, very large amounts of memory. And of course, correspondingly, very, very large amounts of computational time. Or you can use light propagation volumes that are cascaded. Instead of using one large voxel grid to store your things in space, you can um, use a, a hierarchy of large, uh, one large coarse voxel grid over your total world, and then a smaller one in it, and a smaller one in it, until you have a really high resolution one close to your player. That has actually been implemented and is part of a superlighter, um, but it is still not fast and awesome enough. So what, are there any, any better methods? Yes. And that are, this is called blended cascaded cast radiance hints by Vero, which is lots of words, lots of complicated words combined. And I think it's a basically new invention in this, uh, in this technique. It is a combination of uh, radiance hints and uh, radiance caching and cascaded uh, volumes for, for storing them. So um, if, you, if you're doing shadow mapping anyway, and uh, uh, well, basically looking from your light source onto the scene, you don't really just have to store depth. I mean, you, for shadows themselves, you only have to store depth. But while you're at it, you might also just store normal and color as well, because it's just two more texture rights. And then it gives you the advantage that for your already cascaded shadow maps and shadow grids that you have, you also have color and normal information. And what you can then do with these cascaded uh, information is store radiance hints. Now, what are radiance hints? Can you go to the next one? Um, yeah, so if you're doing shadow maps, you know light hits a pixel and it has a color since you just evaluated that. And then you can take the, the every pixel that you hit basically as another light source for illuminating the other radiance hints in the area. And the secondary uh, um, hits are then used exchanging these. Now, first of all, this sounds very expensive because basically every pixel that you hit from your light source gets a new light source, becomes a new light source, and then does the same thing again and again and again. But it can actually be quite easily simplified using the spherical harmonics um, used before. Um, yeah, here are your sketches. So if you have your voxel grid and you have one node in every of these cells, I mean, this is one node, it has a neighboring cell, and you know what your, you know, the, the, this grid cell covers this part of the scene and it illuminates this part of the scene, and you know normal data and you know color data and you know shadow data for every part of it. Um, so what you can then do is you, you take for yourself random points that have just been illuminated by your shadow map 
and say, okay, yeah, this this here uh, actually contributes to our cell, and this is not shadowed away. I mean, this one is in the shadow because it looks that way, and that one is too. Um, and then you you sample these things to get your average radiance in the cell from your pixels. And yeah, um, then, then if you have your light source here and you see this one, this one, this one, this one gets light, this one, okay, yeah, well, the shadow is not exactly correct, this one isn't. But you, you know your average illumination in your cell, and you just take the average of them and sample how much light goes in. And then you encode this as the spherical harmonics in, uh, in second order to say, okay, light, since the point that's hit there has a normal there, scatter some light in this direction, light here, scatter some light in this direction. And then you have, uh, uh, for every voxel, uh, um, voxel point, you have information of how much light scatters where. So you can totally say this one primarily reflects there, and this one primarily reflects there. And this information can then be propagated to your neighbors. So um, what you have to do for that, I mean, what you could do now if you want to transfer radiance from this one to this one is to actually see if you include and basically do ray marching between everything and everything, which is very expensive. So don't. Um, instead, you just store what is the maximum and what is the minimum uh, uh, sample distance by just approximating them, casting a random ray. This is something that can actually be, be pre-calculated if you want to uh, have this grid static. And then use this to test, to stochastically test if you're occluded or not occluded. So yeah, if we now want to secondarily bounce to just transport uh, stuff, we just randomly sample our radiance field by saying, OK, I want to know what is the radiance here. And I ask my neighboring pixels and interpolate between them, and then propagate that light based on this spherical harmonics to my target point. And here, my minimum and maximum bounce distance helps me to shadow off things that are most likely shadowed. Even though it's only stochastic, it works really well, except for points that are in, in very convoluted geometries. But in these very convoluted geometries, this is where the fudge factor I told you about in the beginning comes in, where you can say, OK, this is a point that is really not suitable for this method, so we turn it down. Yeah, um, exactly. You, you integrate over your neighboring uh, samples and look at how much um, uh, the, the hemisphere is aligned. So if you're in a point here that is actually just shadowed in more or less all directions, you don't take any samples from there, but you do take them from there. Yeah, and exactly, this is where the, the minimum and the maximum interpolation distance is being used to, you know, even if it might be, uh, this sample might be visible from that sample, it's probably a bad idea to directly use the contribution. Better just, um, limit yourself uh, to, to stuff between the minimum and maximum distance that you, you previously measured. Yeah, so we use this probabilistic um, attenuation metric to, to get the, um, the contributions correct. Yeah, and now the first bound, of course, um, we can use the camera depth buffer, which we are using anyway for the shadow maps, or we can use voxel cone tracing or we can use the, the boundary value hierarchy, which is also already there. I mean, depending on what kind of shadow is being used, you can either use the depth buffer to get your radiance to the pixels in the first place, or you can do, use your actual ray tracing that you're doing for the shadows as well, anyway, to get your things. So both of these are implemented in Superlighter, um, depending on what kind of um, shadow information you use. Yeah, and then you reconstruct your global illumination finally. Once you have, you know, put in the original lighting and you have uh, distributed secondary bounces to your neighboring um, radiance hints, all you need to do is to actually, from your sample, go ahead and look at the hemisphere that basically illuminates your, your, your target pixel. Um, originally, the idea was to use four taps and to, um, to, to spread it out in space somewhat to, to remove jitter or any algorithmic problems there may be. But it turned out that actually one is, is just fine. So uh, a single lookup turned out to, give not, uh, to have not given any big difference in, in terms of, of graphical fidelity. Um, yeah, so uh, I think part of this was uh, there earlier. There's four of these nested volume cascades. So the, the points we've seen before, um, if they're too coarse, of course, you might clip through geometry and maybe look bad. If they're too, too tight, you have the problem that you're wasting memory. 
um, and it's being blended between them. I think the next picture shows how they normally distribute it. Oh no, okay, this is the caching thing first. Um, since um, we're basically simulating the same thing again and again and again here, uh, we've got light coming into a scene and it's being propagated uh, uh, between them, so we might actually cache if we have skylight illuminating a scene, we can already pre-calculate the skylight occlusion that hits our, our radiant sins, and then we don't need to update all the visibility information between them if they're the same anyway. Only if we're moving through the scene rapidly and more you know, new cells come uh, uh, to our, to our uh, voxel frustum, we need to recalculate them. Everything before can be stored and cached. So apart from the first frame where the entire lighting information has to be built, it really gets fast because this is, the, if our view information, uh, if our view position is here and our viewing system looks like this, it's entirely sufficient to have the cascaded four level shadow maps here sampled as 60 instead of 32, but you know. Only if we move in this direction, we only need to update the next row of visibility information. Everything else is cheap and free, since we're caching it anyway. Yeah, and uh, then there's two possibilities to actually get our specular direction, because now we've got this indirect lighting information, but if I'm standing in the shadow and my primary light source is not directly the sun, but some reflectivity from, from Barrow's face hitting me, um, then I have to find out what is my specular direction, where is Barrow's face from me. Um, and there's two possible ways to do this. Um, uh, one is simply to, to, to look at the spherical harmonics of my radiance, my closest radiance hint, and say, yeah, okay, the, the highest contribution probably comes from that area, and use the center of that as my specular direction. Or what you can do is you go a bit, a couple of centimeters out from your surface. So you take your current sample and a couple of centimeters out, and you can actually derive both the specular, specular direction and your average diffuse direction from taking the difference between them. Because as you move away from a surface, of course, you get some additional additional information from the reflection from the wall, which allows you to, to um, interpolate uh, between the two. And this actually works nicely, because it gives you not just a specular direction, but also the average skyline direction, which in the beginning we had in, this, uh, in the formula for the action analytic light um, calculation. OK, um, now. Uh, the, the skylight, if, if you want to illuminate your scene with a skylight, you don't just have the sun lighting up stuff, but since we've now done this, this very advanced uh, simulation of the atmosphere, you also have the blue sky all around you illuminating. So how do you do something like an occlusion test against the entire sky? You can't just trace in random directions all the time. Um, instead, this is another method of tessellating space, not uh, using a, a, a cubic grid, but using a tetrahedral grid. So you scatter par uh, grid points over your, your, your entire world space. You can do this randomly, or if you want artist control, you can place it in points where it's important to have high uh, resolution lighting information. And then if you want to calculate um, values here, you can interpolate between the nearest grid points by doing a Delaunay triangulation of it and getting tetrahedral mesh. OK, and ah, okay. Uh, can, can you ba go back one? Uh, and what happens now is that the, the, um, at the top of the map, uh, light information is being uh, included into this, uh, uh, introduced in this tetrahedral mesh, and then the spherical harmonics um, information of the skylight, so that there's the sun and brightness here, and then there's some more here, is being diffused through this mesh and giving you skylight information in every mesh point. And then you can interpolate to see if your currently evaluated pixel does have visibility of the sky and what spherical harmonics components um, contribute to them. OK. And so all of these combined gives you um, uh, the, the wonderful sky shading that uh, is in the um, in uh, uh, Superlight now. I don't know if you, is there an image of what it looks now like? Because we've had the early images in the, in the slides. Can you can you switch to 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 web browser and show what it looks like now, or should I? Okay, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna first finish with what the slides have. Um, we've now had the the cascaded radiance hints, which works really well. It gives you indirect lighting. You don't need to pre-bake anything. It is of course an approximation, and sometimes occlusion doesn't really work right. Mostly it does, especially for the geometry in in uh, Superlighter. It does really well since there's no tight spikes or thin walls. Um, and it has the advantage that it is a completely 
real-time approach that you don't need to manually fiddle with in order to get in, uh, to global illumination on real-time scales. And then in the future, um, the, the plan is, or Bero will continue to improve this thing, and maybe next year we'll, we'll be standing here with even more beyond the, uh, beyond the current state of the art um, uh, illumination, te illumination techniques. So now the search is a good radiant hints compatible solution where emissive surface lights can be put in. The same way that the sky is not a, a point source if you have like, for example, in the futuristic racing game, large areas of advertising that illuminate the scene. How do you put this into radiant hints? How do you model that? Um, people are doing area lights, but people have not yet found a good way to do area light GI. So Barry is looking for somebody to help him with that. If you are interested and know something about this, talk to him. Yeah, and then the future is, apart from the emissive surface light injection, more real-time optimizations, um, rendering uh, of explosions will be important. Also, illuminating things with explosions is a problem that is still quite complicated. Um, yeah, and then real-time to path tracing might be the way of the future to get ar around all these, you know, all these complicated data structures you need to almost get GI. Just brute force it. It may not be there yet, but in the near future it will be, we will see the first real-time productions during path traces and it will be glorious. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, if you have any questions, Feel free to come to me or Bero. I guess you may want to watch the compost now. And I think we will just show a video of how, how, how Ray Marcher, how, how Superlighter looks now. Or do you have one available? Ah, and, and um, yeah, Bero wants me to tell you that the slides will be available. Um, he, he will upload them uh, today. Uh, where, where will they be? On the, on the Revision website? Uh, at www.rousseau.net. I think that is also linked on the on the description of your talk where, where you can find the slides. So if you're actually interested in re-implementing any of this or all of this, you're very welcome. Source code is available in the slides. And yeah, any, for any questions, talk to Bero. <laughs> OK.